Welcome, I'm Mike Briscoe. Uh, I'm with the American Society of Naval Engineers. I'm their educator in residence. Um, I'm actually pursuing a degree in educational psychology, but today what we are going to talk about is a lot of engineering, what naval engineers do. Um, we have a free video game called Fleet, and if you want to download it and play it, you can do it during this event or this weekend or two weeks from now. This game's always available, it's always free. Uh, you go to fleetengineering.org, there's a button that says download fleet on the left. It doesn't work on Chromebooks or tablets, but you can ha make it run in any other device that you would like. Any laptop computer really, uh, or desktop. But what I'm using it for today is actually just talk about engineering, so this isn't going to walk you through the gameplay. We're going to talk more about what naval engineers do. And so, this cut screen showing what a dry dock looks like. Uh, ships are usually made of metal. Well, ships are made of metal. Boats are often made of metal. And that requires welding and some other things that require a dry workspace. So we pull the boat in through here. We pump the water out through these pumps. And then we're able to actually work on the boat. Naval engineers work on the boat and, you know, throughout its life cycle. So naval engineers and naval architects uh, design ships. And we're going to talk more about that towards uh, in a little bit. Um, naval engineers maintain ships, and so we'll talk a little bit about things like corrosion and some of the, the things that these kind of engineers work with all the time. Uh, naval engineers maintain systems on ships, which include keeping helicopters, what they call helos, uh, working. Uh, there's obviously a lot of electronics, communications, uh, that's the radar towers, and the, um, the, you know, the, the, the things that work with satellites to share communication information across the sea. Uh, so a ship really is like a floating city. Uh, there's people on there. They need all the things that you need in your house, right? They need water to drink, food to eat. They need a place to use the restroom. And all that has to happen at sea, thousands of miles from the shore often. So uh, these... And, and to make all that happen, there has to be a power source that's kind of like an uh, you know, like electric plant in your neighborhood that is giving you all the things that are making this computer run and the lights turn on and everything else. Uh, so all those systems need experts. All those systems need to be designed and maintained. And that's really what the heart of naval engineering is. There's a lot of specialties. We were just talking, and I'll show you uh, in a little bit. There's a... Um, uh, an event we usually have in F the Philadelphia area, uh, we usually have one conference there a year. Every other year, one's focused on intelligent ships. Um, at the Philly Naval Yard and talking with them, they, they, you know, they, they're kind of all mechanical engineers. But if you grab five mechanical engineers, they probably each do five different things. So, like, we're talking about doing an industry panel um, at the end of April. And... Even if we had five people that technically had the same background, we really do think that, uh, or we know that their jobs are so just different that they'll get, give very unique perspectives to what naval engineers do. So let's walk through the structures real quick, and I'll just talk about how this engineering happens. So I'm going to uh, actually look at what's on this ship. What just popped up is this hydrostatic chart. This is a video game, but it's really a physics simulator, and there are 3D modelers. You might use them if you have 3D printing at your school. Um, those kind of things that make these objects, we add an, an additional component. If you're using Autodesk, there's a computational fluid dynamics uh, module that you can add to it, where you can see how liquid would interact with your 3D models. Uh, I'll, I'll look at We'll talk a little bit more about that idea when I show you some of the things that our college students are doing. Um, but the basic idea here is that these simulators are using the same background and frame as your video games. But these engineers are making things that go out to sea. Uh, they're often making a, a bit more money uh, because a lot of people want to make video games. This is kind of the same feel, but you're actually making a tangible good. Uh, when I've been to conferences, so this game is backed by Unity, so it's on a Unity platform, and like BMW designs all their parts on uh, Unity, and that way they can explo explode, expand the designs and contract, and they can send those 
designs around to make it easier for people to see how to make each part and how each part fits into the bigger whole. All these ideas are just, you know, taking some of that video game knowledge that you do have and expanding it to some more of these real world applications that require simulations. But uh, what, what ships need is they need to balance the force of the water and the force of gravity. And so one thing that you may not consider, these ships actually end up being a little too light. Uh, they push too much water out of the way. And so if you can imagine like a soda can on the top of, a, of water, it's just going to empty soda can. If it's empty, it's just going to tip over. It's too, uh, it's too light. It's just a, it's a bunch of air in a little metal container. That's kind of what these ships can be if we don't add a ballast tank. So what ballast tanks do is add water in compartments on the very bottom of the boat. Uh, this game is a little bit, uh, well, we don't have budgets here, but the game, <laughs> the, these ships cost a lot of money. Uh, we, we made it, them cost about between one and two million, but they cost a hundred and a th or a thousand times more than that, depending on what they're doing. Uh, but these ballast tanks are really cheap. It's just a bunch of metal boxes. The ocean water is free. So we fill in a bunch of weight. Uh, if my ship is weighing 431,000 kilograms, uh, I probably added 145,000 kilograms of water to the bottom of the boat. That way it sinks into the, into the ocean a little bit more so that it can't be pushed as easily by waves. And I'll show you what that looks like uh, in this simulator in a moment. Uh, in a few minutes. Uh, hauls, working on the hauls, repairing the hauls. Underwater welding is, um, it's, it has some risk to it, but it's definitely a well-paid career. Uh, there's a lot, there's many good jobs in that. We make rudders. That's what actually makes the ship turn. And then the superstructure is the integration of all these um, electric components, the steering wheel. It, it ties everything together. It's where the people interact with the ship's components to make the ship do what the people need it to do. Propulsion systems really vary. We just have diesel engines in this video game. Some of the larger ships are powered by nuclear power plants. When I was doing a job fair at Fort Meade High School two years ago, um, I was talking with a nuclear engineer. Um, he was 26. Uh, and that's you know one thing I'll thread throughout this. There's a lot of pathways into naval engineering and into engineering in general. Um, about as the American Society of Naval Engineers, about half of our members are in the services in some way. Coast Guard, Navy, Merchant Marine, something like that. The other half are private industry, uh, and so there's a lot of companies that support this. Some which are huge, like Lockheed, uh, BAE, things like that. Some that are smaller, um, and some that are like naval architecture firms that really specialize in like one or two uh, aspects of this project, and they get really good at it. And then they become, you know, a good, well-paid consultant on a lot of this work. Um, but uh, the, the, so the person I was speaking to at Fort Meade was 26 years old. He never went to college, but the Navy kept recognizing that he had the skills and talents and the, the ability to work hard to learn the material. And they just kept putting him into different classes so that he could become, you know, the nuclear engineer on a ship, on a large ship. Uh, so there's a lot of pathways here. They don't, you don't have to be, uh, you know, paying a lot of tuition dollars to be able to become a naval engineer. Uh, but there certainly are uh, students that follow that path as well. Uh, the propellers, and actually in your neighborhood, there's a propeller foundry uh, just south of Philadelphia where they do a lot of this work because it's really, I think it used to be in art. Now with the, our computer models, we really are able to understand how each curve and each square inch of the propeller uh, can help and um, you know generate more power, generate more power silently, generate more power in a way that doesn't create another force that sucks the power out of the, the, the force of the engine. So there's, uh, there's a lot of movement and there's still a lot of great work being done to make these propellers. And then with the advanced materials that we have here, I only have the helicopter on here. Uh, our ex executive director at ASNI actually was a helicopter pilot in the Navy. Uh, he went to the Naval Academy, became a, a pilot, 
and that was part of what he was doing as part of his service, and now he leads the American Society of Naval Engineers. Uh, I'm going to do a quick check. So the plus sign set shows things I don't have on this boat. But uh, we've got communications, rescue boats. We talked about those. I already put everything in that's propulsion-wise. Uh, in the game and like in the Navy, there's a lot of different things that these ships get asked to do. Uh, one thing that our conferences kind of have a big threat about these days is about modular design. So that way you can put on and off different packages to make the ship be able to do different things. Whether that's a Coast Guard ship that can go between like drug interdiction in the Caribbean Sea to being ready to do some patrols and some safekeeping in a more Arctic environment. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that these ships are able to do when they're modularized. So that way the the skeleton, the, the hull, and the superstructure in that is really strong, and it's able to support a lot of other changes that we make to the design. In this game, you do what? Uh, search and rescue, you do supply and logistics, there's some combat practice, and there is some heavy seas drone work. So if you are interested in a little bit of uh, doing a little naval engineering, uh, I'm just going to do the first test and show you that, uh, just like we're going to keep talking about, a big part of engineering is testing, taking data, and then seeing what you like and don't like, and making those revisions, just like every engineering project you've had in school. Uh, what I'm about to do is do a stability test. So the dry dock is going to generate a wave that's going to push my ship, and then we're going to see whether it feels safe to be on when we go out to sea. And it barely rocked. I probably should have made a bad ship. I always default to making a good ship. But this ship is really strong. That, that water in the ballast tank made it so it was easy. So it was able to withstand the stability test without really making a danger for uh, sailors to be on. Uh, if you, when you use the game, we have speed tests. So it's like straight line speed. We have maneuvering tests, which is really important. You always take a ship out and you see how it works when you do hard turns left and right or starboard and port. Uh, there is combat practice. This ship isn't set up for it. The ships are actually a little bit smaller for that combat role. The rescue practice is where we go out and we actually practice using the, the, ship's the cargo on the ship and the helicopter to rescue people. Uh, I'm going to leave it there because it actually is pretty cool. There is a ton of videos that we have on uh, Twitch and on our YouTube channel. Uh, we're the American Society of Naval Engineers. Uh, you can always go ahead and look that up. And I'm going to flip over. Oh, you don't need my mail. Uh, so one thing that we did uh, just, just on Friday, uh, we had someone from the, from the Carteract Naval Base. So this river over here is the Potomac, so, but this is just Maryland, and that's Virginia. Uh, but she talked about material science. So there's a lot of materials on the ship. The Navy has hired her, uh, and she leads a team, uh, and she designs different materials that go on the ship. Uh, in her presentation, she talked about how they designed a new composite. So that's a mix of materials that replaced the catwalks and took 14 tons off of the ship. Uh, and so this is where she works. So they have Center for Innovation and Ship Design, What's in the middle here is the long tow tank where they do testing of models. Uh, this tow tank is so long that the, the water actually curves by three millimeters and they had to curve the metal bar that drags the ship along it to match the curvature of the water. And it's curving because it's so long that the earth is actually curving over that length uh, in a way that they can measure using their tools. Uh, they test explosives in the pond. They do structural mechanics. They have a, a water tunnel. The uh, there's they look have you you there's a lot of solutions that end up coming from things that we did previously. That's something that they did decades and decades ago was good, and then it got outdated. But now, whether it's a new material or a new simulator or a new something, we're able to start using that again. So this curator of ship models is a really good way to go and find uh, solutions. Uh, if you're in computer science or if you've done any engineering, uh, looking through models of things that have worked for different things previously 
uh, is a real good way to you know find a new solution when you kind of get stuck in these problem solving loops. Uh, they actually fabricate things on base and then the maneuvering and sea keeping the mask basin is just an awesome place where they're able to replicate a lot of different wave conditions and actually see how things are going. Um, in the summers, they host the Robo Sub competition, which is a collegiate competition where college students make submarines and uh, they have a lot of fun testing them out, making sure they're working and then actually having them compete against each other. So this is kind of a place where naval engineer happens. The video game kind of showed the aspects of the ship and how we kind of think about them as engineers. Um, but for what I want to talk a little bit more about is diving more and more into people that actually do the engineering. Uh, so when Dr. Foley does her engineering, she talks about how they have to identify the target of the components, really hone in on those requirements, uh, fabricate some prototypes, and do some evaluation and demonstrating. I would imagine that some of you are nodding right now, right? Like this is the, the engineering design process. So the things that you are learning are preparing you to do this work. The trial inspection and institutionalization. Uh, the hard part actually is a lot of times works great in the lab, but then you got to get it on a ship and you got to get other people to take care of it. So it's not only good to have the great idea and a nice prototype, but actually that rubber hits the road when you get your design into the real world. It takes a lot of people. It takes a lot of different people on those teams. You need some program managers. You need some people who are really good at speaking and, and creating documentation for different groups. Uh, you need people who talk with the engineers that really are able to take the laboratory findings and say, you know, you really can't have this too close to the boiler because it will, you know, heat will cause these issues. So there's a, a lot of different people on these teams that help to make sure that these things uh, are able to be used in the real world. And Dr. Foley, uh, she's one of the leaders that really makes sure that that happens, especially when it's de designs that require a unique or new material science. And I would say, as some, uh, one of the things that really uh, might surprise you about naval engineering is obviously we've been on boats for thousands and thousands of years, but the research is really still happening and pushing things forward every day. Um, one of the, gr the group, one of the partners that we had for making the fleet video game uh, is now called Martin Defense Group. It's also called Navitech. If you see that when you look up YouTube videos, you'll see... Um, Navitech uh, is tied to fleets, um, a lot of fleet videos out there. But as it, like one of the in industry leaders here, uh, they do a lot of design and prototyping for simulators. So they make you know video games like Fleet, but they make simulators, uh, and they don't call them video games. But they're able to really take real world objects, make 3D models, do extremely accurate testing. And water, you know, like every drop, every bit of water is creating a force and making it, and making um, a push or a pull on the surface of the ship and, and making changes. And then it's dynamically changing itself, which is creating different forces. So this is not a simple solution. And companies like these have worked really hard to both get the physics into their video game, but then to do real world testing, video or simulator testing to make sure that it's actually uh, showing what would happen in real life. So this company also does a lot of research in autonomy, which you should think of like robots, uh, but making these things at sea operate on them, their own without any uh, humans on board. There's a huge cybersecurity component, and I think we'll touch on that again later, but if you have, if you're interested, if, if, if financial, in, uh, Finances are the main driver for your career choice. Uh, cyber seems like one that has a lot of job opportunities, a lot of very high paid job opportunities. So if your main thing is to make money in your career, I, I highly recommend cyber. And then you know, cyber in a naval context will definitely be a high paying job. Uh, power and energy, like I said, you know, there's a lot of energy creation on a ship and uh, that 
energy can be used for one thing a lot right now, which is radar. Uh, and then another thing, which is uh, energy-directed weapons, which we would call lasers in a video game. Uh, but they're actually getting pretty close to... And they've used uh, these energy-directed weapons to destroy, especially aerial targets. Um, there's a... I think that they're going to be a bigger and bigger part going forward. Uh, but obviously it means that we need to be able to create and store more energy on these ships. And then, you know, again, this idea of designing materials, manufacturing new materials, whether they're plastics or composites or whatever they end up being. Uh, we talked about on our Friday webinar that, you know, using, um, you know, even recyclables, while not probably going to be, uh, top of the line for this kind of naval engineering for a, a lower stakes like a, a boat or um, a craft that's used by like the weather agencies to get into salt land marshes things like that you know there's an opportunity also to start solving some of these other problems in the world you know with recycling being one of those solutions using some of these engineering processes so martin defense group is is one of the companies that works in our space these are some of the things that they do uh, and this is a pretty good cross-section of what naval engineers do. Uh, this is the conference I was talking about. So it's the end of the month. Um, it's called the Intelligent Ship Symposium. It's virtual, uh, given everything that we're going through now. But what I wanted to highlight was that this is research being presented. I think they have 37 papers. Most papers are produced by a, a couple people, a few people where they get together, they do research together, they write together, and then they publish these, this research together. Um, so this condition-based maintenance kind of touches on that idea of these ships are out at sea, they're, they are experiencing a lot of conditions, and maintaining those ships is really important so that uh, we keep the, you know, the ships out at sea as much as possible. But it takes a lot of work. It's in a lot of ways, you know, with plastics, we found this when we start recycling them. But it's a lot, e it's a lot easier to make something strong the first time. It's a lot harder and takes a lot of real good, thoughtful work to keep things going uh, after they've been already created and, and interacting with the environment for a long time. Uh, automation of machines, whether those be out at sea or or within other things, um, finding ways to make those processes automated so they're both faster and require less human hours and less human maintenance is a big deal. Power systems are always important. Again, this conference is called Intelligence Ship Symposium. So these ships are going to be doing a lot of things that require electrical power. Uh, having a reliable power system uh, that can withstand a lot of you know, being out at sea, possibly being in a combat situation, things like that, it takes a lot of hard work. Uh, automated failure, recovery, cyber, and distance support. So, uh, when drones are out, you need to have a backup plan when they can't communicate with the, with the controllers. Uh, and also, if they are being attacked by other cyber, uh, atta you know, cyber weaponry, uh, or, you know, in this case, the weaponry could be code and could be trying to mimic the, the satellites, the information that's coming from the home ship. And then providing that support at a great distance because some of these things are operating, you know, many, many, many miles away from where they are, where the, the people are standing. So there needs to be great support over that distance. Systems architecture and engineering. Um, there are many, many systems on these ships. Being able to coordinate those systems together so that they achieve the goal is really challenging. We actually hosted a, a combat systems professional development course that was eight hours long and it was it was really good but uh you know it was, it was more content than we could fit in an eight hour day to actually talk about how these systems should work independently and then together uh it's really a lot of of information a lot of thinking and a lot of good planning this kind of engineering can also feel a lot like uh, program management, where you're trying to coordinate inputs and outputs across a variety of systems. Uh, with power systems, we need to store that energy often. Uh, 
and then modeling and simulation that's involved in the power system but also modeling and simulation involves um, the ability to do some of the work that we need to do to do in testing uh, on the shore um, and then again we need to keep looking this is a second tract of automated failure recovery cyber and distance support at the bottom because this kind of working with drones and, and thinking about the real problems and possible problems um that's something that people are really doing a lot of research in and it's going to be something that's pretty interesting so there's there's going to be many papers on each of these topics at this symposium what we do is we uh, i need to scroll up a little bit when we get together we have keynote speakers so a rear admiral is going to is going to give his thoughts on these topics and kind of give a, an update on what his group and cyber engineering is looking into to help inform the researchers and the practitioners so like the engineers in the navy that are doing this work right now and then we're going to you know do the actual q a with the tech with the paper authors and then have discussion panels that involve different engineers in this case about unmanned machinery so these kind of conferences are, are really interesting. It's something that you want to look into no matter what field you go into. That there's going to be professional organizations that represent your job. And those organizations are going to have conferences. Um, after the last year, we had many of those conferences will be available for virtual. There'll be a hybrid where you can go and be in person. And then you can also participate virtually. Uh, I would definitely look into C. You could even look in the summer uh, if you find a conference that you're really interested in. Uh, see if they have a student rate. Often they're free. Sometimes there's like a $25 or $30 ticket. Um, but if it does seem like it's too expensive, give them a call. Say that you're interested and see if the, you know, showing that you are putting in the extra care by making that call will get you a free ticket so that you can be involved. I would say that once you start becoming a professional, to go. Because you're going to sit down at lunch, it's awkward, it's like your first day at school, but you're going to make friends, right? You're going to start talking to people next to you, you're going to get to know their company, and it's a way to network and broaden uh, both what you know and who you know, and then as you look for people to help you with a project you have at your company, or if another company has a position that's really great for you, maybe that person lets you know, and uh, that kind of networking is really important for both expanding what you know and expanding who you know. Uh, the second day of the conference is kind of the same thing where we have discussion panels, more papers, and more discussion panels, and then closing remarks. Uh, so these kind of conferences are available for all industries. A naval engineering conference looks like this, where we dive into the research about the cutting edge things. Obviously, like many industries, ours are centered around electrical systems, uh, using computers, simulating things because they're cheaper to find out problems when they're in a computer system before we actually start putting them into metal and electrical systems uh, and then uh, actually uh, pulling all that those pieces together one thing that ASNI is doing to help uh, the industry is called promoting electric propulsion for small craft and so what this is is a five mile ah, let's go to this picture it's a five-mile boat race that we're going to have at the U.S. Coast Guard Yard. Uh, competition rules, maybe. There we go. And so they're going to have to start here and go up and back five times, and it makes a one-mile loop. Uh, the thing is, is that their boat can only be powered by electricity. So they probably need to have batteries on board, right? And then they need to have electrical wires that connect to the propeller. But then they also need, you know, some motor that actually turns that propeller, right? And then they need some kind of control to control the motor. And then they can buy the hull or they could find a hull that works for them. But a lot of these teams are going the extra mile making their own hull. Um, and so these are mostly seniors in college. Uh, I think we saw it for a moment. Uh, these are the schools that are participating in our event this July. Um, we have a bunch of new schools that are also going to be adding to the competition over next school year uh, but let's look at a little bit about what that what their day-to-day -day work so this is the update from the University of Georgia where 
they are ordering parts and cleaning uh, out uh, the boat that they found. Uh, they removed all the gas components from the boat that they are working on. So they're changing it from a gas powered boat to an electric powered boat. So they're in this progress report, they're updating and saying that they removed all the gas components. They figured out the gear ratio, which is not, it's just good hard work that they did. Um, and they ordered trailer chains and they got some of the security materials. So what they're still doing is getting the electric motor and they're going to be putting that into their boat once they've got it, you know, now that they've got this place for it to go cleared out. Uh, they're doing some of like the technical registration stuff that they need to do. Uh, a human factor solution, putting in a seat, always good to have a seat on a boat. Uh, and they already did the order and they received it and they tested the motor. Testing the motor determined the battery size. So the length of the race kind of informs them how big the boat needs to be. That kind of tells them how much power they need to generate from their motor and propeller setup. Once they get their motor in-house, they can get a better read on how much battery it pulls. And then they can think, well, if I have to go five miles, I should probably give myself like a little bit of overage but I need this much battery power to power my motor for five miles plus 50%, something like that. Uh, and then they have some problems, and there always are problems. But you can kind of see, if you hear from a computer science de you know, designer, this kind of scrum idea where you, you try to tackle as many problems you can in these two-week sprints. Uh, you work as hard as you can to solve the problems, and then after those two weeks, you identify the new problems that have popped up, and then you make a new plan to, to address those uh, problems. And then you just keep working that way till you get to your solution. Uh, this is a, a web page in the PEP program, but I just want to highlight what some of the work did. There is a 26-minute presentation that kind of gives the nuts and bolts of how one college team went through and did this work. If you want to look at it, you can go to the PEP under education, promoting electric propulsion, and then when you get here, uh, pep talks is where we keep all of our recordings. Uh, but what, what they did was they actually investigated the types of hauls that they wanted, and they found that the mono haul was good, but it's wobbly, unstable, and, you know, it leads to instability. Uh, the flat bottom was easier for, for fabrication but again, this wasn't as stable. And then what they ended up going with is this design. And actually, I'm going to come down here because I know that's small. Uh, and so this is actually a 16-foot long design. Uh, it was designed to be printed from a 3D printer. And so they would print each of these three components. Um, the total print time was four days and five hours. So to... Uh, uh, printer that creates things at this scale works on like three pulleys so it can work in three dimensions but it just goes for hours and hours of extruding the actual just like the 3d printers you see that are much smaller work but it's on pulleys so they can do it over longer tracks um, but even you know it takes a long long time these uh, things that we're going to connect are metal uh, so they were using multiple uh, materials and then what they found in more testing was that they still weren't happy with the rigidity through here so they made a wooden endoskeleton that they can put into the inside of the main uh, hull and you can see these kind of design how it looks from the different sides from the top from the middle from the uh from the side and the other side from the outrigger. So this is the out, this piece, and then this is this piece here. Um, but this is the kind of hull design and fabrication that is also at the heart of naval engineering. So I think, uh, I really appreciate your time. Uh, it was a lot of me talking. I look forward to your questions. Uh, but one thing I, you know, I want to get across is that there's a lot of pathways into naval engineering. There's a lot of different companies and people in those companies that work with naval engineers. Um, and then naval engineering, like engineering is all about solving problems. And the problem is 
how to do this, whatever this is on the sea, whether it's investigate bald eagles, uh, drive, you know, get to uh, Florida to the Middle East as quickly as possible, or to use some kind of weapons package. The, the problem is that at sea, and it takes a lot of diverse skills and strengths and tools uh, from both the hull to the electric system uh, to all the different uh, AI and computer systems that are on these ships to actually do those things. So please ask questions, uh, and I look forward to talking to you about naval engineering. Thanks again for your time.